four of us here, we no longer accept federal farm program payments. That's right. We bowed out of that program, and that's the beauty yeah. we're seeing in regenerative agriculture. There's hundreds, thousands of other producers that are doing the same thing. So we're moving everyone forward at the same time. And there's an incredible amount of freedom as a Absolutely. farmer, as a rancher, when you decide to bow out of that, those programs. Absolutely. That's Alan, let's talk about that. You as a tenured professor, and, and I know you wrote a lot of papers and did a lot of research, but just how applicable is that? your work back then to what we're doing today. Yeah, it, it's pretty interesting. So 15 years in academia and to get tenured and promoted to professor and all of this, you've got to have done a lot of peer reviewed research and, and have a lot of publications. So I did, I was a good academic, you know, did my job. Um, but the truth is in what I've come, I didn't know it then, but I know it now. The vast majority of the research that we're doing in agriculture, first of all, it, it's based on what we call a reductionist model. That means that we have to have small plot replicated research where we're controlling as many variables as possible. So we're really only looking at one or maybe two or three variables at the most and trying to control all the rest of them. But what I now realize is that that research is so limiting that instead of being able to take those results and extrapolate them and make them applicable to true landscape scale agriculture, that instead those results are terribly confining. And so in academia, we have made an enormous mistake. We have tried to make extrapolations and assumptions that are completely wrong and unfortunately, that has led both us as researchers and academics and farmers and ranchers to draw the wrong conclusion. And the ecosystem has degraded as a result of the application of that uh, reductionist uh, research. Wouldn't well, you say so? Well, right? what we're, like Alan's saying, we're trying to make nature linear, and she's nonlinear. She's not predictable. Right. Right. There's many flaws in our research, and some researchers are saying that model's wrong, and it has to be changed, and it, and it's caused a lot of damage, and it's meant well. So a lot of the research was built on the wrong premise, asking wrong questions, and so and it, this is what it's led to. So it, it's a major problem. And and a lot of our agricultural research is based on theoretical modeling. Yeah, and. You know, when you build a model, you're building in all of these mathematical equations into that model, right? But what happens, you know, bad data in equals what? Bad data out. So if we make erroneous assumptions that we plug into those theoretical models, then it immediately negates that entire model and the results of that model. And I just want to make a comment about this. Look. We're not saying we don't need reductionism. reductionism. It, it's a tool, but you have to back up, and like Alan's saying, how are these things connected to each other? Ecology says the relationship. How do these connect to each other and how they work? So even the medical field's like that. Yeah. Very reductionist. So when you go to the doctor, they'll reduce you to a liver, to a throat, to a, uh, to a colon, and they'll break you up into pieces and put you into a specialist. But rarely do you have a doctor said, no, let's see how all of it's connected, and then as, look at you as a collective whole. Mm -hmm. We've done that in agriculture. We've broken it into small pieces, and we forget it's all connected, it's all one. So it's very important for everybody that looks at, works with natural biological systems, you have to back up. So, so then let me ask a question relative mm -hmm. to that. All right, so... Our body is comprised of what? Carbon, carbon, okay. oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen. Yeah, <laughs> and, and limbs and organs and, and all of that, right? Trillions okay. of cells. Okay, and trillions of cells, and what else? Mostly biology. Okay, so what we view as Alan or Gabe or Dave or Ray, we are thinking just simply our physical body 
and our physical organs alone. But what else are we comprised of every day? And if we're void of, we will die. Billions and billions of microbes, yeah, right? right? On us and in us. Mm -hmm. And if we take those away, see, most people don't even think about that. Mm -hmm. That, you know, because we want to put Germex on our kids' hands every day, you know, to get rid of these billions of microbes. But yet we cannot exist without them and, right. and we cannot even begin to be healthy. Why are people taking pre prebiotics and probiotics and all of these types of things today? Because we so damaged ourselves. So if we cannot exist without these billions and trillions of tiny microscopic organisms that live on us and in us every day, then does not the rest of nature work that way as well? And so are not plant, soil, and microbes one intact organism that must function together. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. I think soil science was taught very poorly. We taught that the, the plant and the soil were different. Really, they're, they're one. Because the moment you take the plant out, you can't have soil biology. If you take the life out, you have geology. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're saying. You, you gotta make that plant one with the soil all the time. And I think that's a really difficult concept for farmers to understand how, how they're so intimately connected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I'm gonna paraphrase a quote by Norman Wurzba here, but he says essentially, farming is about far more than production of products. It is a window into the character of humanity. Yeah, and so then that leads me to ask the question, how have we evolved in our farming and ranching so that we are ignoring the very thing that allows us to subsist and thrive?